is up, guys? This is Sal. I have a new guest on today. It's J.M. Rymson. He is from Boca Raton, Florida, and a very successful businessman. Um, so let's get started. So, J.M., what has it been like growing up for you? Wow, that's a big question, Sal, and thank you for having me on the show. What's it been like growing up? It has been a series of, you know, scraping my knees, you know, bumping my head along the way and and loving every minute of it, man. It's uh I grew up in Montana originally and uh ended up in California post college. Now I'm in Florida and uh f- four businesses later, I've been married 17 years now, two kids and so I guess that's my story of growing up, brother. It's going from being an athlete and blowing out my knee to finding my path in other other ways and my passions and other things. So it's uh it's been fun, man. I love life. It's it's been a wild ride and and uh, it's been fun. What sport did you blow your knee out in? Several actually. Uh, I've I had three uh knee surgeries at this point. So soccer is how it started. Then my second one was in football. And my third one was in college and basketball. So it was just uh, two in high school and then one in college. So it quickly took me from, you know, if you had asked me as a kid, what were you going to be? I was going to be in the NBA and you couldn't, you couldn't tell me anything else. Three knee surgeries later, arguably I wasn't that gifted enough to anyway, but you know what? Uh, I'm glad it happened the way it did. So you played soccer first and then football. Yeah. So I played every sport growing up. You know how it is right now where even my kids, they get singular sports really fast. Like they Mm -hmm. focus on one really. That wasn't how it was for me, man. I played basketball, football, baseball, soccer, swim. I mean, name a sport and I probably did it outside of hockey. And so my freshman year, this really pissed off our high school football coach because I was a quarterback, but I also loved playing soccer. Same time of year. And I chose soccer over it because my mom didn't want me to get hurt playing football. Okay. Well, guess what? My knee got blown out in like the third or fourth game. Uh, And so my uncles who both played college football are like, see, Lynn, that's my mom's name. You can get hurt doing anything. So needless to say, I ended up back playing football, but my true passion was basketball. So that's where I ended up. That's cool. I argue with my brother-in-law because my nephew's four years old and he is humongous for being four. I was like, dude, he needs to play football. He's like, no, CTE. He's playing soccer or anything else other than football. I'm like, you know, concussions are way more prevalent in soccer than football because you actually have protection in football. Not to say that you won't get hurt, but it's. I'm like, why? That's like a stigma, I feel like, with football. It's like a big stigma. It's a hard one, man, because if you're like me, my favorite sport to watch and the one team I genuinely care about is a football team. Like I'm a Packer fan. I was born in Wisconsin. I was put in green and gold before, you know, I knew any different. And trust me, those were painful years for a long time. But my (laughs) wife and I have had this open dialogue about the same because my my younger boy is he's a big kid. He's strong. He is all about team and so many amazing lessons you learn on a football field. And you can't deny that. I, but, I agree hundred percent. And with the head thing too. So it's hard, man. Mm-hmm. I, I it's, it's, it's hard because it's a beautiful game, but there's going to be, you know, you get hurt playing any sport. So, so I actually coach high school football, so I'm kind of biased with it. I get it. <laughs> so, so I am a little biased. I will admit with that. Um, it is, I would arguably be one of the best team sports there is out there by far. So many sure. life lessons in football. Yeah. I mean, dude, I, we talk about three days, two a days, like summer. You cannot replace some of those lessons for those 15, 16, 17 year old boys, man. Yeah, absolutely not. Like we, we hone on, if you want to be successful, if you want to play for our team, like you have to be in the weight room in the summertime, you're not going to step on the field, right? It's, why it's not required, it's extremely recommended in the offseason that you are in the weight room. Again, where you're probably not going to play. Unless you're a multi-sport athlete, which is fine, but but even still. And it, it's funny to see now that um, when I was in high school, a lot of sports teams didn't really use the weight room. Hmm. But football. Now, cheerleading, basketball, golf, soccer, tennis, they all are using the weight room. And like football's like, was that kind of like guiding guiding stone there 
to to other sports getting involved. And now you see these kids that are multi sport athletes. It's like we encourage them to be multi sport athletes because we know they're going to get the weight training in, whether it's with us or or whatever. So it's just football is just one of those sports. It's like a really good sport, and I would recommend anybody to play. It's, just, it's a lot, and right. the the best kickers are soccer players, by the way. I have no doubt, that out. Just want to point that out. Our two last kickers, our current kicker, who actually just got an offer from Princeton University, and the one that I played with, he went to Delaware. So they're both former soccer players. So, fun fact there. So, I guess growing up, what was the most difficult part for you that you experienced? I mean, we just talked about it, man. You know, when I blew out my knee, that was really hard because so much of my identity was wrapped around being an athlete. And when you get that taken away from you for, you know, the first one was an ACL. I mean, I was out almost a year back then. And so that was a real challenge to go from, again, you, you, you know, being recognized or whatever as an athlete. And now you're on the sidelines and so much of who I was, was wrapped up into that. And so for me, that was no question about it. The biggest challenge, and it happened twice again in my formidable years as a, as a high school kid to where I had to say, okay, is this still, you know, who I am? And, and it was into college, but after that third time, I had to start looking differently and say, there's way more to life than just sports. Now I love sports, brother. I, I am passionate about it. But for me, realizing that I'm more than just an athlete, right? And then I would, I also sang in college once I had hurt myself. And then I got to do some acting in college. So it was this blessing in disguise to have these injuries happen. Mm. Realize that, look, man, I'm not one thing. It's just like in business. If somebody's like, hey, what do you do for a living? That's maybe the last question you will hear me ask somebody after a long conversation, because the truth is that's just one label. And it's such an easy one to say, I'm this, you know, I'm a mindset coach or I'm a, you know, a chief leadership officer or chief, you know, marketing officer, whatever title I've had at some point. But it's like, look, man, you're way more than that. And one of the things I talk about, Sal, is labels are for boxes, brother. They are not for human beings. So you're more than just an athlete. You're more than just whatever your job is. We wear a lot of hats, right? You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a friend. I'm, I do do business, but I have so many things. But I think early in, in my childhood, I, I got checked quick because of these injuries to say, I'm more than just an athlete. What is it like for you starting your first business? Or I guess kind of back up, like college. You went to college, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, what you do now, is college anything related to it or does it have nothing to do with it now? Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. I've, I, that's an interesting question because right out of school, I went into sales. And you could argue, because I graduated with communications and psychology as a double. Okay. You argue that communication is a part of any job, any mm -hmm. career there is. So I could easily make that. But if I were to say, did I take one you know, class and I can apply it to what I do from communications? I don't know that I could say that. I could say for psychology, there's one course I'll never forget. It's abnormal psychology. That gave me so much more empathy, so much more grace into people in general to say, look, Sometimes, uh, you know, we're all wired differently and that's okay. So I would say, yes, I apply it, but it wasn't like I came right out of school and I'm like, okay, now that I have these degrees, I'm going to go be X, Y, or Z. I just found my path through kind of, you know, looking for a job. And then I started realizing, oh, I like people a lot. And what do you know? Communication is now a huge part of what I do with my podcasts and, and mm -hmm. coach all the things that I like to do. So what was it like starting your very first business? Uh, it was amazing. It was scary. It was fun. Um, so when I first took, uh, so my first business, I had worked for Enterprise Rent-A-Car right out of college. That's, that's where I started. Mm -hmm. I realized about three and a half years in is I didn't like people get putting a glass ceiling over how much I could make. 
And I really didn't love the fact that I, you know, I had to be somewhere at a certain time all the, and being told what to do. So I started and, you know, being an entrepreneur after that. But here's what's interesting. When I had the conversation with my dad, I remember this phone call, never forget it, because I said, Hey, dad, I got a new career. And he's like, Awesome. What's the salary? And I said, Oh, there's no salary, dad. And he's like, Okay. And he goes, Well, tell me about the benefits. It must be absolutely incredible, this benefit package. And I'm like, Oh, no, they don't have that, dad. And my dad did not cuss. He goes, What the F are you doing? (laughs) And it was one of those really, defining moments in my life because he was a both my parents but you know big decision makers at that time for me to defy what he really felt was security and to go into entrepreneur so it lit a fire under me because he basically said you need to go find a job you need something secure and, and I decided no this is what I'm going to do just as I had done the same thing when I went to college I defied what my parents wanted because I had a full ride swimming scholarship over here, or I could go play basketball and they basically paid for my books over here, much smaller school. Mm-hmm. But the, the reason I think these have imprinted such a, you know, influence and it just, it's stuck in my head is this was my decision maker saying, I disagree. I think you're making a bad choice. And they ended up being the best choices for me personally, because it gave me some grit and determination to make sure I made it. So how was it? It was scary, man. Like I I didn't have my parents going, yes, this is a great idea. But, you know, several years years into it, my parents are like, wow, what a great path for you. I see your passion. I see your vision. And so it ended up being awesome. And what was your first business entail? Yeah. So when I hired on the gentleman that hired me, I remember sitting in his office, it was in Sacramento, California. And I said, Hey man, why don't you have this everywhere across the nation? This, 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 it was, it was helping people with life insurance and annuities, but they had this lead program and they were helping people. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, why would I? And I said, why not? So after I had proven myself in doing sales myself, I said, let me just show you, I'm going to go up uh, and we're going to open up our first operation outside of Sacramento. And I went to uh, Beaverton, Oregon, Portland area. Mm -hmm and open that. And from there, he's like, dude, we can do this everywhere. And so we did, we opened eight offices in that first company. Then we merged to a second company to go nationwide, but it was just, um, gosh, man, I, I just, there was nobody saying I, I, I I couldn't do something you could do Mm -hmm. as much as you want. And it was like, why don't we, if we have this ability to go help a lot of people, we have a great product, let's build out distribution around the country. And that's where I found my passion. It wasn't sales. I was good at sales, but I loved building teams and leadership. I love that. What, what was the, what has been the most difficult part about building businesses for you? Oh man, the most difficult part. There's the, you, you get your teeth kicked in a lot. Um, when we first moved up to Portland, so it it ends up being a success story. But probably the hardest part was the fact that you got to go all in. Mm-hmm. You got to believe, and you no matter what, you have to find a reason to keep going. So when I opened that office, uh, my wife, uh, we just uh, got married. And a month later, boom, she's pregnant. Well, the problem was her benefits did not come from California. So we're about to have a baby with no insurance. Well, I had also poured all of our savings into opening this office. Mm -hmm. Probably the hardest part to answer your question is just kind of the mind screw that you can go through as, wow, there's no safety net. What if all the what ifs, all the people saying this is not safe all their insecurities being lumped onto you, you have to be really strong and really, I guess, you know, have vision to say, it doesn't matter all the reasons I can't make it. Why can I make it? That was probably the hardest thing for me early in my career. And then the second thing was just genuinely being myself. Because I remember when I first started in leadership, brother, I wasn't. I thought I had to look a certain way. I thought I had to sound a certain way. I had to just 
talk and all these things a certain way. But the truth is the most attractive leader I can be is just me. And that is, so I, I gave you two, but those would be the big ones for me. Love it. How important is it to build relationships? Uh, it's the most important thing that you can do connecting with another human being like you and I. So before we actually went live, what do we do? We, we, we talked a little bit, we connect mm -hmm. about where you live, where <clears throat> I live common interests, because that means I genuinely give a care about Sal. It's not just a transaction. We're not just going to do a podcast and be done. Mm -hmm. I want to actually care about what Sal's doing, his audience and, and how we can best serve the, the, what we're going to do today, but serve your audience. Yep. And so that connection piece, don't, don't lose sight of that. Any of us, because it does move the world is when you can genuinely connect with another human being emotionally, you can do so many great things, but if it's just transactional, that's exactly how it will be. It'll just be one time done. You'll never talk again. Yeah. That's not real rewarding or fulfilling, but when you connect with another human being and you can lift them up and they can lift you up and you win together. I mean, that's why I call my company. Let's go win. Mm -hmm. When we do that together, it's beautiful. Do you think like a lot of salespeople oftentimes just care about the, the monetary value and then don't build a relationship? So in turn, either they don't get the sale or they get the sale and then they don't get a returning customer. The, the bad ones. Yeah, the the desperate ones. And you'll see it. I I mean, I have so many stories of watching really gifted salespeople mm -hmm. as they get, you know, commission breath, as you might hear sometimes, when they need that sale, they forget the connection piece. I won't say that her name, but there was a gal, one of my most gifted salespeople up in Portland. Okay. Mm -hmm. She had gone 0 for 14. And she's on the verge of quitting. She's in tears. Because again, it's 100% commission. She said, JM, I don't think I can do this anymore. I said, okay, let's go out. So I go out with her and I see her on this ride along. It was with this really cool Romanian couple in, in Portland. And she gets to the part where she has to ask for a check in order to get them pre-qualified to go through for insurance. And she got really uncomfortable the way she asked for it. And they're like, no, I'm not doing this. And so she tried to ask again and they're like, no. And I said, can I just interject for a minute? I said, all she needs is a check for $150 or whatever the amount was, but I think it's about $150. Oh yeah, we can do that. So Melanie, oh, sorry, I wasn't going to say her name, but Melanie's like, jam. Well, I don't get it. What just happened? I said, look, you made them feel uncomfortable. Is that right? And they're like, yes. I said, you just have to be very uh, they have to trust you, Melanie, because they are buying you. It's not the product. They are buying you. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what happened. She ended up having 26 referral clients of uh, a bunch of Romanian folks in Portland because they didn't have trust in people in that industry. And Melanie ended up being their guide. So to your question, yes, mm -hmm. if you lose sight of the fact that you're there to provide value and they are there to trust you and you cannot trust someone if you don't connect. It's not going to go well, but if they genuinely connect with you, like heart to heart, you will do well. And if you're not focused on the money, what was that like aha moment for you when you were like, oh, business is like for me and this is going to work. Oh, when did I know it was going to work? Um, man, that's a hard one. I don't remember the profound, like, aha. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I received an award about six months in. Uh, I, I had broken a national sales record and I had no idea. And this gentleman presented me with a Mont Blanc pen, which I, I'm a kid from Montana, man. I don't know <laughs> what Mont Blanc is. So I'm like, cool. And then my buddy says, do you understand he's never done this? I guess that would be where I really felt confident in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't realize that I was breaking records because at the time, the gentleman who ended up being my business partner, he was riding me hard how I wasn't performing. I wasn't that good. What he had realized with me from an incentive base, if you tell me I can't do something, that's exactly what I'm going to go do. If you sit there and pat me on the back all day long, I will become complacent. I, it's not for me. But if you're like, you can't do this, that's when I perform at my best. So that was probably the closest thing to an aha where I was like, cool, this guy, Brad, 
he gave me this pen in front of the entire uh you know company and said this is the next coming of blah 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 and then i was like all right cool i guess I, i'm i'm decent at what i'm doing how important are habits and how do you break and create new habits or good habits Dude, I love this question. So habits are vitally important and we are run by, you know, our days are run by them. Now mm. I will replace habits slightly with just, I, I like routines personally. Okay. And, and it's not that you have to do the same routine every day. That's not, I'm not going to go down that because look, if you have kids like I do and, and like this morning, my morning routine was different than it will be tomorrow. A hundred percent, but taking care of certain things. And the three things I will tell you that every single one of us needs to take care of on a daily is taking care of our mind, taking care of our body and taking care of our soul. It's the first thing I coach clients on because when I ask, Hey, what did you do for yourself today? So often I get blank stares. I get, well, I took care of the house. I uh, took care of the business. I did a X meeting, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. What did you do for you? Because you can't perform at your best level. You can't be your very best self unless you do those things. So how do you create that? You have to be grossly and wildly intentional about making sure you're doing those things for you. Uh, bad Habits, uh, probably the best book I've ever read on that, uh, in my opinion, is The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Mm -hmm. Just placing something that's maybe negative, the, the cue happens. So for instance, I chewed for a long time. Again, kid from Montana, I chewed tobacco for a long time. At 35, I quit cold turkey. Why? I don't know other than I replaced that with I'm no longer a chewer. Now that's um, James Clear. What's the name of his book? Um, atomic um, habits. Yeah. So Atomic Habits. Atomic habits he, that's an identity shift, right? Like I'm no longer, I'm, I'm not a chewer. I'm like, uh, uh I'm an athlete. I'm whatever other than that. Mm -hmm. So when you place your identity with something else, then it's just not something that you do. But I love this question because you, you don't think about brushing your teeth on a daily thing. That's just a habit that you do. That's a good mm -hmm. habit. You should all do that, but you should be just as intentional or more with taking care of yourself. And, and there's a couple of other small things you can do. Every single one of us, before my foot hits the ground, before I get out of bed in the morning, I say three things that I'm grateful for. That little practice, I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't care how bad it is because I promise you this year, I, I could compete on woe stories this year. I lost my dad this year. I have a business partner that stole a, a tremendous amount of money. I've had some crappy things happen, but you know what? It's the best year ever because I choose to make it the best year ever. So I love this question, Sal. I hope you ask everyone because I am passionate about creating proper routines and having good habits. Yeah. So I generally have a couple questions I ask everybody and that that's typically one of them. Yeah. I, I always, I'm always curious to learn, like everybody has different version of, of these questions and it's always fascinating to, to understand like everybody's version. Cause then you get to really piece together how you either want to shape your own or maybe fix something that's not working for you. Follow up kind of similar to this is how do you stop procrastination? Mm, yeah. You just get moving. I, I know that doesn't, it's like, well, yeah, but it, I, I this happens with my son, all that my youngest son, mm -hmm. he's so gifted at whatever he chooses to do, but he gets in his head about the end result. So for instance, let's say he's a baseball player. And he needs to do batting practice. If he looks at, oh my God, I got to do two buckets because this is what I committed to. That's a lot to take on. But if I say, hey, bud, let's just go outside and hit a couple balls. And once he gets moving, now he's starting to create momentum. Mm. The other thing that helps with that is celebrate your wins. If you got up and you actually got started, great job. Give yourself a high five. Give yourself... I don't know something that you like, you're going to reward yourself. You get to have, I don't know, a treat that evening. You get to watch something, something rewarding yourself. Those are two of the biggest keys to get rid of procrastination is just get moving and celebrate. And if you can do those two things, it's amazing how much you'll do. So for instance, one of my, my goals has always been read 10 pages a day. 
Well, often I'll end up reading 60 pages that day just because I got started. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not very often I'm going to read less than 10 more often than not. I'm going to read 20, 30, because you get into it. Same ideas, just, just get moving. And it, it becomes really easy. If someone's doing a ton of things at once, maybe they're just busy with their have They just wear many hats per se, maybe um, whether it's businesses, they're juggling multiple jobs and trying to start that business. Um, what advice would you give to that person? What are the three things you have to get done today in order to have a successful day? So often, uh, and if you're sitting in my office right now, I have one notepad with a bunch of stuff that I need to do, quote unquote. And then on the other notepad, you'll see three things that I have to do today to have a successful day. The other stuff, if it doesn't get done, like if I don't answer my emails, is it going to make or break? Not even a little bit. I might piss some other people off that I didn't answer them. I might create a little chaos, mm -hmm. but if I, let's say, made X amount of sales calls if that was my job, or if I reached out to all my clients, or if I took care of my body so that my health doesn't fail. Whatever your three things are, if you just can focus there, you will accomplish so much more than just trying to be a taskmaster and just get tasks done. If somebody's at the point, a lowest point in their life, what advice would you give that person? Uh, the, what I asked uh, or what I said earlier, I would have them talk or verbalize the three things they're grateful for. Okay. Uh, when you're at your very lowest, I know it's like there's no light. All you see is darkness mm -hmm. there, man. I, I think anybody that's dealt with trauma, you've been there. But no matter how dark it is, there's always something. Like, for instance, if if it's the worst moment right now, you can say, I'm grateful to be breathing because and I know when it comes to mental health, somebody could argue, well, maybe they don't even want to be breathing anymore. Okay, cool. I got it. There's something there. There's something you enjoy. I, I'm grateful for wine. I'm grateful for, you know, uh, my, my brother. I'm grateful for pizza. I really don't care. There's something to be grateful for. And if you start that habit, then you will start to see the light. And that is the one thing that we forget is there is no light without the darkness. Mm -hmm. So at its very darkest, just remember light is coming next and you can't appreciate the light without the dark. In, in your own version of it, what is kind of the secret to selling? Oh man, <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, so it's not about you. That's the biggest thing you need to understand. Now you used the word earlier is connection. Mm -hmm. So right now we have multiple things in the way. If I was trying to transact with you, because there's a microphone in uh, in front of my heart, there's a microphone kind of in front of your heart, there's a screen in front of me. So these are things that are all impeding us connecting. Mm -hmm. And there, this goes deep into psychology. So maybe I use psychology more than I realize, but it is not about me, first and foremost. It's about Sal. So if I'm trying to sell Sal something, I need to ask him questions about his pain points. Okay. I need to ask Sal what he's looking for. I don't need to sell anything. I need to ask to really seek to understand what's going on with Sal. And you'll tell me everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. And if my product serves that, whatever that product is, the, the, the transaction's already done. Because I've connected with Sal. I understand how he's feeling. I'm not going to sit there and yammer on about how great my product is. I need to understand what Sal's looking for first. What be, <clears throat> sorry, what would be some like kind of example questions that would maybe be kind of generic to like really get that pain point, those pain points out of somebody? Sal, you, you had me out here today. What were you looking for, brother? What, what, when you had this appointment set up, when I called you, let's say I called you. What were you really looking for? Well, you just called me. No, there's something going on, brother. Is there something that's lacking in your life, you know, that, that would make your life better? You start talking. Okay. What about this product? And then it's just, it's what, it's how, it's why. And you just keep repeating over and over until they describe what's really going on. I, there will be so many objections thrown out before. So I can actually deal with it. But if I go in there and I don't ask those questions, mm -hmm. you create a mess. 
So one of the first things that, that I like to do when I sit down is it's not, hey, how you doing? That's such a terrible way to start with that poor rapport. So let me ask you something, man. How's your day going? Tell me about you know something you're passionate about. I'll get deep with you fast, and then we can start to talk because we'll start to develop some trust. But if I don't do that first, you're not going to open up to me, and this transaction is going to go poorly. I like that. I love it. What is your version of the entrepreneurial mindset? Uh, it's grit. It's it's. Well, it's four words is, is really what it is. It's belief. You have to believe in, in yourself and in, in what you're doing first. It's finding joy in what you're doing. Uh, that could mean embracing the suck when things are at its worst of that. Uh, it's going all in. So often people are like, well, I want to do this. And they kind of put a toe in the water while they're, they have everything over here. You got to go all in, man. If you want it to work, you got to go all in. And the fourth one is grit. Like if you are not willing to get a little dirty, a little grimy, a little bit of just getting your teeth kicked in and still smiling, you're probably not going to make it. So those would be the four words I associate with it. And I actually wrote a uh, article on that because Dabo Sweeney is a, a Clemson football coach who I'm a big fan of his. Okay. I think those are the three things he does is he believes he finds joy in everything he does. He's pleasant to be around one of the best recruiters in the country because of it. And he's all in man. He's not giving you some effort. He's giving you all his effort. And so often you see people kind of like laissez faire their way through the day. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. If you, truly trying to build a business, you got to go all in. You got to give it everything you got and not be afraid to fail. You're going to fail. I promise you, you're going to fail on a daily. And that's where you find the joy in that. Like, Hey, I tried something new today. It's a, it's a, a great question. Another good one. Sal. you have some good ones. How? So I feel like oftentimes like entrepreneurs do kind of run into this. Maybe not every, everyone, but like the idea of like burnout and like, how do you kind of prevent that? I'm getting into that. Yeah, uh, that is a, what is your vision? What are you doing and why? If that's not in front of you on like a board, something you can see on the daily, you will get burnout. It's going to happen. The second thing is what we talked about, taking care of yourself. I can't tell you how many executives I work with that they're crushing it financially and their health is garbage. Their relationships are garbage. and it's like, that's what's leading to burnout. They're crushing it. There's so many zeros in their bank account. You would think this guy or gal is on top of the world when they are at their darkest moment because they're, they're on the verge or maybe they got divorced. They have no relationship with their kids. Their, fail, their health is failing them and they can't truly enjoy it. In order to make sure that you don't have that, you need to focus on three, three areas, in my opinion. Health is number one. If you're not health, that is your wealth. Okay. If you're not healthy, you're not wealthy. Plain point, simple. We've seen this too many times. Your relationships is two. And you've talked about that several times connection. And the third one then would be your business. How healthy is your business? Does it rely solely on you? That's not really a business. That that's, that's a JM enterprise that that's not a business. So those are the three things when I'm coaching people, I'm like, look, we need to focus on your health first, then your relationships, then we can talk about your business. Kind of going back to education here. Do you think this current school system is built for entrepreneurs? No, not even, not even a little bit. I love your direct answer to that. Yeah. I, you know, look, it's hard because my mom taught for 39 years and she is remarkable. She's one of the best teachers. I'm biased. You know, it's my mom. Mm hmm gave everything she got but to teach entrepreneurs not even a little bit if i could do some education reform if that was my passion which maybe it someday it will be but it's not right now mm -hmm. i would love to teach these kids a, a couple things just about again persistence about grit some of the things that aren't really taught getting an a on some algebra test does it really matter 
I don't know. Maybe it, it proves that you you can do the work. Um, but the memoriza- memorization thing, I'm just not a huge fan of. Now, again, I've studied abroad once I blew up my knee. So I did have a kind of saw the European style. Mm-hmm. And that's way more about uh, learning the information, about actually retaining it. It's not about just cramming facts in your head and spitting it out. So, yeah, there's some work to be done there. Something I like you said about the, the A on the algebra. I was in an interview not too long ago, and a question came up about my education in high school. They looked at my uh, high school transcripts, and they were looking at algebra. I had a D in algebra. They're like, You're, you do all this business stuff. How did you get a D in algebra? I'm like, you know, I don't know. I'm getting with numbers, just not dimensions i guess i don't know um but yeah no I, it's something that i pr- and i personally preach this like to a one-on-one scale um with like my my athletes right like i tell them like look dude if you're not gonna go play college football or another sport in college why go to college like what are you going to college for right because i know like where i'm at in my book i went to college right i followed the, the stigma go to college because you need to go to college right um, mainly cause I was going to law enforcement and I, I am, and you do somewhat need, they say you need college. You really don't. Um, you, you, you don't, there's no way in, you, nothing you do on the street really translates to college. It, it doesn't maybe reading, but that's about it. Um, but now I preach it to them, dude, take a gap year, figure out what you're passionate about, do something you love before you even go to college. And then, and you know, after your gap year, if you're like, I still don't know. Then maybe go to college. Maybe try out a semester. But give it time. That's what, sh- looking back, like, I'm only 22. So looking back, that's what sh- I wish I would have did that. Um, but I didn't. Um, but that's kind of what I preach now. Like, it, it's really not. It's kind of a broken system that we have it, currently. Yeah, I think whatever you put into it, you're going to get out of. So mm-hmm. I will say I, I'm, I'm not pro college. I'm not against it. I, mm-hmm. I think. If you go in intentionally looking to do something, i.e., I want to go meet everyone that I can. I want to experience the world in a safe, safe, quote unquote, forum mm-hmm. where before the, the world really, you know, I have to take on responsibility. I think that's great. Go meet so many amazing people. Go learn about different cultures. One of my favorite parts about studying abroad, I lived in, uh, there was three apartment basically complexes together. There were 60 kids in the unit. I had people, my, my roommate was from Italy. I had people above me from Japan. I had people over here from Spain, Scotland, like surrounded by people around the globe. That was an opportunity that I probably wouldn't get for the most part if I didn't go to school. Okay. And I was intentional about it. I, 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 I learned so many cultures and how big the world is. I think college can provide some of that for sure. But if you're not intentional to your point, if you're not clear on why you're going, I agree with you. Don't go take that gap year. Be intentional. And this is life in general. This just isn't college. Be intentional about what you're doing and why. And if you don't know why, get quiet with the mind. Spend some time and figure out why am I doing this? Not because mom or dad said to or my, you know, all my friends are doing it. Why am I doing it? How important is self-education? Uh, in my opinion, it, it's way more important than what we just talked about. Okay. Um, there's some really unfortunate stats about how many people actually read books post high school and post college. And it's really disappointing for someone like myself where I, I read 30 to 40 books a year. I, I love to read. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite things to do is to educate myself, to open my eyes to all these incredible authors out there, uh, or podcasts like this or meeting people. The moment that you stop trying to learn, you are decaying because the body is only in two levels. You are either you're growing or you're decaying. And if you are truly doing self-education, you're growing on, on the daily. But if you're not, you are slowly but surely decaying. So I hope everybody hears that. More than anything on this episode, I think Carol Dweck did it better than anybody, certainly in the last quarter century, and that's growth mindset. 
when she wrote that book, and I think it was like 07, 08, whenever mm-hmm. it came out, she is changing education reform. She is doing education reform because you see growth mindset in every curriculum now. So self-education is that, right? Trying to get better on a daily basis. So I'm passionate about that, man. I, I, Man, for 22, you're really good at these questions. I got to give you nothing but credit, man. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I, this is like passionate for me. So I like, think I was like really trying to. So I've been studying this now for like my, since I was 18, this, this space, right? So like I've developed these questions after listening to countless hours of podcasts. Like when I'm working out, that's all I do is listen to like Tom Bilyeu. I'll find somebody on on YouTube, Steve Harvey, uh, Negro, uh, was it Neil DeGrasse Tyson, like all these people. I'll listen to them. That's all I do. And that's like you start to pick up like certain questions to ask people because they're I think they're trigger questions, right? They're questions that you can maybe mirror to get something off of you, like which we have done so far. Um, and they create conversation, right? It's not yes or no questions. They're experience experiential questions right i want to learn about your experiences because that's going to help shape my experiences later down the road if i'm dealing with somebody or maybe you get something from me that i would have never got if i didn't ask that question right so that's kind of where those come from you're mastering your craft brother i think it's amazing great job keep it up i appreciate it um who's your role model now or, or really could be anybody and like what have you learned from them wow um man that's i've learned so many people I'll give you a couple authors because we were talking about education. Viktor Frankl wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, he has shaped my perspective more than probably most. Nelson Mandela, there's a story of of him um, when he got elected and the fact that he had the prison guard that uh, looked over him for 19 years, the prosecuting attorney at his um, the night he was elected at at the inauguration dinner. And somebody said, why are you, do you have them there? And he said, because if I didn't, I'd still be in prison. <laughs> That's remarkable because you think of all the awful things that he went through, these two men put him through. And he said, if I didn't invite them to the dinner, I'd still be in that prison. So there's another one. And then, you know, my, 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 my parents and my grandparents, I mean, I'm blessed to have amazing role models in my home. Um, I've lost, you know, most of them now, other than my mom and, and one of my, my grandmother's still here. And so I still take those opportunities to ask some questions today because you can learn so much from people older than you that have been there. They, there's wisdom there. Mm-hmm. So that would be the, the third one. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to somebody coming up in the world, whether they're 12, they're 14, 16, 21? Stay open. Uh, to other human beings. Don't ever close your circle. Uh, at some point you think, oh, I'm good. I got this great group of friends. Stay open. Stay open to bringing new people, new experiences in. And the second one, and this is as important, is show up as you. I coach on this a lot right now. At some point we put on masks and we try to fit in with the crowd. I think it happens at like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And we mm-hmm. also on these masks to fit in, to look a certain way. Well, these masks, we keep piling on and we start, you know, um, really uh, our our non-negotiables now are being challenged and we are compromising on our values. And what I would tell you is when you take off those masks and it's just you, it's just the the five-year-old you who has those dreams, that light is bright. Let that shine through. So if you can, the sooner you can take off the mask and show up as you, the sooner your business, your relationships and your health will thrive. But it takes, it takes some courage to do that. So that would be the second one. For somebody who's struggling with self-confidence, whether it's again, trying to go in front of people to sell one-on-one, a crowd of people trying to get into a relationship with somebody, um, you know, love, love type of relationship. Um, whatever it might be, what would you tell that person? I would tell them to take care of themselves first. Uh, do you love yourself first, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have confidence in your word to yourself, i.e., and I'm not the only one to say this. I've heard others say the exact same thing, and probably on Bill, you show, 
But if you keep your word to yourself, that builds confidence, i.e. I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow. Now, often we will lie to ourselves all day long before we'll let someone else down. And that's crazy because you are with you all the time. Mm -hmm. When you when you commit to something, when you say, I'm going to do this, this is one of the biggest lessons I learned from my parents. Do what you say you're going to do. Does that mean it's going to be perfect? No, we all screw up. We're all going to mess up. But you want to build confidence? You do what you say you're going to do. You follow through with it and you watch how that starts to rise. So just just commit to whatever it is. I, I put all my goals in, in my bathroom here so I can see them at least twice a day. And I make sure I do what I said I was going to do. And if I didn't, own that too. Like, I didn't do that. All right, I owned it. I'm not being the victim. It's not because something happened. I chose not to do it. But that's also empowering to say, I can choose to do it tomorrow. I can choose to show up the way I want to. That'll build confidence. I love that. What does success mean to you? Freedom. Uh, freedom to, to be with those that you love, to do what you want to do, to truly pursue your passions. I, I think so often we forget, and I love your background, by the way, with, with the two flags, because it tells me freedom is important to you. It, it, it means a lot to you enough that that is your background. Um, those are symbols of freedom. And I, I think so often we forget that we live in, a, in a, at least our country where we do get to make our choices, right? Mm. We, we don't live in a communist you know, country. We don't live in a socialist country. We live in a democracy where you get to choose what you get to do. And this is not to get on a, a platform and this isn't, I know some people have their political challenges with what's going on. Yeah, of course. They'll get choices, right? Mm -hmm. You can choose to show up and be your best self, or you can choose not to. So for me, success is freedom. So on the kind of the other turn of success, what are some failures, or I should say, how important is failing? You know, I think failing oftentimes gets this negative connotation um, throughout like school. You know, you're taught as a child, oh, you can't fail. Um, you know, you get the F on, on, on that paper, you know, go back to school. You know, it's the end of the world. Um, you see, you know, I see it sometimes too with uh, with athletes. Like they get all stressed out because they got a bad grade on a, on a test or or whatever it might be. So I guess how important is it to fail and how I guess learning from failure too, right? Uh, at the end of the day. Well, you said the key word is there, there is really no failure unless you quit. That's failure. If you decide to quit because it didn't go your way, that's a failure. The other reason you would fail, quote unquote, is if you didn't learn from it. So you could call what I do failing almost every day because I'll shoot to do something new and I'm not good at it and I'll fail, but I'll keep trying and I'll get a little better. Just like you talked about with the podcast, you've been studying, you've been grinding, you've been working at it. I guarantee if you go back to episode one to episode 109, it's radically different. And I bet you 109 on will continue to get better because you quote unquote, failed and learned, okay, this was good. This was bad. This was, I want to do a little bit better at that. But the only reason you ever truly fail is if you quit or you don't learn. So I love failure, man. I I, I embrace it. And I wasn't always that way, by the way, either, because I, I also was an athlete that when you didn't win that game, oh my gosh, it was the biggest thing in the world. No, it wasn't. It was one game. You learn how to get better. And I don't care if it's a championship game. Okay, you own that. And you know what? That was in high school. Guess what? You get another chance in college, perhaps. Or if you're not playing ball anymore, you get to learn so you don't lose that championship game in business. I mean, you learn more lessons from failure than you do from winning, truth be told, from, from losing, quote unquote, the mm. winning. That's a fact. Because when you win, you don't reflect back on what you didn't do well. You just celebrate that victory. And there's a lesson to be learned in that. It's like, let's learn from both wins and losses. And so that's, I love failure, man. It's one of my favorite F words. <laughs> What's your second favorite? Freedom. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love and it. And there's, there's more, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's where I was going with it. I like that. So you got three. Noted. Um, how important is it to build multiple streams of income and like, how do you do that? 
Yeah, good question. Um, I can't say I'm the best to speak on this because I'm around people that have like 19, 30 streams of income. And I think wow. that, yeah, it's really crazy and and pretty, pretty amazing that they can manage all that. It is important. And if, uh, you know, you asked the question, what would I tell my younger self? I would have told myself to do a better job of this uh, because I have built four businesses mm -hmm. at some successful real estate endeavors. I've had some that I totally got my, my butt kicked, but I will say if I was talking to my 22 year old self, if I was talking to Sal, I'd say, brother, make sure you don't just have just one stream of income. You have several because that passive income someday is really that freedom that we talked about. Um, I, I would, again, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm the best investor. I'm, I'm good at investing in people. And so when I invest in the right people, they typically allow me to be a part of those other income streams. So I built it that way. But like one of my neighbors, he's got 19 in real estate and this guy is brilliant. Like I understand the way his brain operates because you want to talk numbers and cents and crunching. He's got it down. And I'm just kind of like, hey, brother, well, how can I be a part of this? What value can I bring to you so I can be a part of these streams of income? And that's how I've learned to do it with him because I don't have the same passion he does in real estate, but I know it's important and I know I want to be a part of it. So talking about environment, and I guess this kind of goes to the idea of like rich and poor and, and wealthy and stuff like that. How important is being in the right environment? So the being surrounding yourself with the right people, I said, never close your circle. Mm -hmm. Here's why. Your circle you will outgrow at some point or they'll outgrow you. Hopefully not, but you know, it happens where you need to be surrounded with people that are lifting you up, not, not bringing you down that environment. If you're surrounded by people telling you, Oh, don't do this. You can't do that. You, you know, why challenge yourself? That's the wrong environment. In my opinion, you want to be around people that are like, Hey, that's a good goal, but I think you can really lift it up. I think you could do more than that. That's a great goal. Those are the people that I want to surround myself with where they're challenging me to be better. They're not giving me a, a pat on the back and saying how great you are. They're saying, I think you can do a little bit more. So that environment, brother, is really important. And for your young listeners, let me tell you something. Your significant other, man, woman, it doesn't matter who it is, make sure that they are are in alignment with you and they want to to lift you up they're not bringing you down and i'm blessed with a uh, amazing wife that she pushes me she challenges me she supports me and us in a way that i'm very very fortunate and i see a lot of people that i've coached um that they didn't have that and that's really challenging because you're going to have tough times and if you don't have that support at home, you don't have that support with your with your close group, it, it, it's going to be harder to succeed. Final question. What is the impact and legacy you want to leave on the world? So when I started Let's Go Win, the purpose is to inspire people to live their best lives. I wrote that very intentionally because that means my work will never be done because it's, it's, it can never be accomplished. Not everybody's going to live their best lives on the daily basis. So my legacy is that let's go win this idea, this movement, this philosophy, that it continues far past myself, my, my boys, if they decide to take it over. That, that's the reason it's not called jmryerson.com. That's why it's called let's go win because I, I truly want Sal, if Sal's winning, I'm winning. If I'm winning, Sal's winning. That's the idea where we're lifting each other up. Mm -hmm. And so I hope they look back someday and they're like, you know what? If they say JM, they're like, yeah, that guy, that guy made my life a little better. He, he showed me some love, both good and bad, right? Like the tough love, if I and they had to have that conversation and the, the nice rainbows and unicorns love, if, if that was necessary as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but let's go win truly made my life a, a better, uh, better than it was before I met, uh, let's go win. That'll be the legacy that I hope to leave. 
I love that. I know I said that was my final question, but I forgot to ask this one. I always ask this one. Um, what is your favorite book? I mean, you kind of talked about this. Um, or, or favorite books that you're currently reading right now and, and why? Well, I gave you two with Mindset and Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, those are the two that I always go back to. Uh, what am I reading currently? I'm reading four different books. One on grief and grieving. I'm reading uh, Three Feet from Gold again. That's another Napoleon Hill, uh, kind of from that Think and Grow Rich. Okay. Uh, just so finished that, that book. Uh, uh, which one? Think and Grow Rich? Yeah, I just actually finished that last week. So good, dude. I, you know what? Put that in on an annual basis. Just read it again and again. It's just, it's so necessary. Um, gosh. After that, it is really hard to pick one. Z- hmm. you, 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 you got me there, brother. You know what? I, I'm going to go with the advantage because I know you talk to uh, this is a lot with business. Mm-hmm. You want to truly create a special company. Go read The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. It's not, I'm not saying it's the most entertaining read in the world, but in terms of culture in terms of asking these questions i think it has helped me more than any other business book that i've read where it's like okay i can see how i've applied so much of that into my business i love that i was on your website of your your uh of red books that you recommend start with why by simon sinek my that's my top it's my top number one book right now (laughs) He's he's brilliant. I mean, look, he he said what we all know, but he said it so well, so concisely. And he is so humble, dude. He's one of my favorite people to watch speak. And and I it's such a good book. I'm so glad you 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 like it. That was actually one of my first books that I read when I started reading um unrelated to college. I never read a textbook in college. So besides that, after high school, um I realized that I have to read because I won't learn. Um, so I started with audiobooks, and the two that I started with was Start With Why and The Third Door by Alex Benayan. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that book or not. Very, ah. good, very good book. I would recommend it for anybody in business because it talks about that there's always another option in a sense, and it always takes a nightclub for an example. Um, you, can either be, you can either sit there, wait in line. You can either be the pretty girl and cut the line, or you can go through the back door into the kitchen, talk to the chef, whatever it might be, and then get in the nightclub that way. And I think a business oftentimes is like that. You know, you can either try and find the shortcut, you can build that connection or, or be that special person, or you can kind of do the grunt work, right? So those books are my favorite, and I'm currently reading um, Mastery by Robert Greene. Mm. Um, so I started with 48 Laws of Power. That was a long book. That's a book that maybe I'll read in a couple of years when I read other books because there's a lot of stuff that there's so much content in that book that it, it blows your mind. Um, how do you read four books all at once? Do you just kind of flip flop? Like, what's your system of that? So, for me, uh, if you're into Taoism, which I am, mm-hmm. I, I, that's one of the books I read on a daily basis. Right? It's just uh, Tao Te Ching. Um, it's it's something that helps me. Okay. Some like stoicism. I'm more Taoism. Um, I've done both, but on, on for from here until I die, I will be reading something from Lao Tzu or Taoism just because it, it feeds my soul. Okay. That's part of it. The the second reason I'm I'm reading it is on uh grief and grieving is because I lost my dad recently. And I know there's work to be done inside to really truly find peace and you have these moments of clarity, mm. um, but I know there's there's work to be done, and I want to find some true peace and happiness. Um, so that's helping. Then the three feet from gold. I just I don't know, man. I just had this calling where I was like, I got to read that right now. Just <laughs> dust it off and 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 get it going again. And the fourth one, I have to look because oh, I know why. Somebody sent it to me. I I did a podcast and they sent me their book. And if you send me a book. That's one thing. It's uh, I, I commit to reading it, and so it's uh, called Iron and Cotton, and it's about relationships. And so, anytime somebody's put that much heart and soul into something, a project like that, who am I not to at least give you know a few hours of my life to to mm-hmm. read 
their perspective was on it. So that's that's why I got four right now. And you wrote two books yourself, right? I did, man. I did. Let's go win. Uh, Keys to living your best life. Thank you for the plug. I appreciate it. And then the second one is Champions Daily Playbook. That's really more of a short, like uh, 11 pages of text. And that's the exercises that uh, I do with my clients. But uh, yeah, man. I love it. All right. Uh, just tell the listeners how they can, can find you on social media. Thank you, brother. Yeah. So a couple places. Let's go win.com. Uh, there's free stuff on there. There's there's articles, a blog that I did. Um, and then the books are there if you want to uh, grab those. And then let's go win 365 on any of the social media platforms. So uh, I genuinely do like to interact with human beings. That's It's not like a, just go follow me. No, I like to hear from you. So love challenge. I love, I love to talk to human beings. So thank you. All right, guys. I want to thank everybody for listening today. Um, it was an honor to have JM on today. Um, I, I've learned a lot, and I hope you guys did too. So, again, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening. I hope to see you guys next time. We're out of here.